Welcome back to A Faster Me. This video is brought to you by Sophisticated and Swanky, one of our wonderful sponsors. There's a link in the description below and a code for 25% off. So we're going to get straight into some racing now. This is the second day of Valley of the Sun. This is the road race. It's a 46 mile road race, at least in the category that I was in. Some of the other fields do a little bit more, 60, 72, 80. I don't know if the pros did 90, I can't remember, but it was uh, significantly more than we were doing. And 46 felt plenty hard. So it is a 16, approximately 16 mile loop. So my race is about 2.8 miles, they estimate. So a little less than three miles. And the first little section as you start is neutral. So we're gonna make a right hand turn shortly and there's a cattle guard and then the race is on. Yeah, and this field actually is a mixed field of the Masters 35 plus and the Cat 4. And the Masters 50 plus. And the Masters 50 plus. And this is the um, Valley of the Sun stage two road race. So yeah, like Ellen was saying, most of this part here is neutral. And then after you make the first right hand turn uh, and get past the cattle guard, um, that's when the race starts. So there's a pace car out in front kind of setting the pace. And then after that, uh, that point, after they turn right, then it's gonna be pretty much full go after that. This is my second time doing this race. Last year was my first time. And even though it was neutral at the start, it started out at a much faster pace. And then I was prepared for when we turned the corner for it to be kind of full gas like it was last year. So it was not quite that, that way this year. Yeah, this is a, a long race. Uh, it had a pretty good sized field. I think it's just about roughly 30 riders. I, I think, think about so. 36. Oh yeah, that's right, because it's a mixed field. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there was 27 cat four, a, a number of 50 plus, and then I believe three 35 plus. So yeah, you probably have closer to 40, 40, 50 racers or something. My goals this race were to stay protected and try to be there to, you know, be towards the front of the group, but just really wanted to work on staying in the draft and not doing so much work by myself. So here I'm tucked in nicely. I'm a little bit further back than I, I wanted to be. Another thing about this, this course is the wind is pretty significant. So there typically is a pretty good crosswind, especially when we make the next right hand turn. There's just a, a lot of wind typically uh, on that stretch. Um, so I was trying to be kind of cautious of which direction the wind was going. Yeah, and you know what? Um, you know, something that, uh, just I guess I'm just gonna point it out, not to bring too much attention to it. But yeah, the young lady over to the right with the yellow bike, um, I can't see her number, so I don't know her uh, name. But yeah, she basically uh, only has one full leg and it's just awesome to see someone out here competing. We all know how hard this sport is. And, you know, for the weekend, I saw her, she has one full leg and there was another uh, man in the, I forgot what event he was in, but he also was, you know, similar situation where his left leg was the only, uh, for the most part, like contributing leg. So definitely great job seeing people out here and they're competing in a regular open field which is just awesome and both are very strong riders. You can see rider 371 right in front of me. She's in my category. So you can tell the divisions of numbers by, I mean the division of category by number. So the 300 numbers were the 35 plus, the 600 numbers are the category four, and there were some 400 numbers out there and those were the 50 plus. So the, the woman, I, I met her, um, Sarah, is her name 
I believe. Mm -hmm. Get it, getting on video, you you second guess yourself, but it's nice to meet her. So the other woman in my category crushed us by about three minutes on the time trial, as you know we we talked about on day one. Um, Sarah and I were pretty comparable, and it was her first time trial. She didn't have a time trial bike, so, you know, great job just getting out, out and doing something new. So we were definitely aware of each other in the race because that's kind of your competition, uh, even though you're competing in a field of, you know, much larger, like much larger category as well. Yeah, and normally Ellen would have raced the open Cat 4. She really never races the masters too often but we have another teammate that was going to be in the masters with her that wasn't able to come so and i was trying to get as many women in the same field as possible so that's why i uh signed up ellen and our other teammate in the masters but normally she would have raced in the open cap four and it's interesting because you know um you race like in the road race or the crit and you kind of have a uh, whatever your finish is and you'd like to see how you compared against everyone else but unfortunately they have it scored separate and you know you're in a big field and it only shows you second or first or whatever because you had a smaller field so yeah just be interesting to see how you compare to everyone in the race as well and I would say I typically prefer the racing in a larger field and not racing just having a, cu a couple people that you're racing against it's like okay a guaranteed podium <laughs> um so but it is different like your mindset is different when your competition is different so that will come into play kind of just in some of my thoughts as the race progresses of what i want to do and how much work i want to put in yeah, and you know, it's uh, one thing to point out too is this part of the road is open traffic on this side. So traffic is open both ways. Um, so there's a center line rule here or a yellow line rule where the riders have to stay on the right side of the road and cars can pass them going both ways. So, um, you know, it's not, it's not idea, deal. It's not what we would like to have, but for the most part, um, it still feels pretty safe when you're out there. So, you know, it's uh, pretty much out in the middle of nowhere, desert road, but it is heavily um, traveled, I guess, on one side. As you will see, there's be a number of cars going the opposite direction. And you can see it is a beautiful day. The sun is shining and the video looks really clear with the clouds in the background, the <laughs> mountains. It really is a beautiful I guess beautiful sport to do out in the middle of nowhere seeing some of the scenery yeah and it says 52 degrees which it felt pretty warm i mean the weather was great for the weekend usually it got up to mid 70s to low 80s which actually feels really hot when you're racing but um you know overall we're kind of spoiled in california when it's 52 out here it feels really cold and you know it starts off cold in the morning but for the most part, it was a pretty warm day or a fairly warm day. Yes, I looked at the temperature and saw that it was gonna be in the 50s and I had my arm warmers and leg warmers on, but the sun just felt different. When, when you got there, you could tell like, it's gonna feel really warm out there riding. So I quickly changed my strategy and <laughs> took off the leg and arm warmers. And Ashley is in this race also and we we took a, a little bit of a wrong turn to get there. Who's Ashley? Ashley Baker, Cat 4. So she's out you here mean, riding you, you too. You mean your teammate Ashley is in the race Didn't also? Didn't I say that? You never said she was your teammate. I Just thought Ashley's I said my race. teammate. Um, but we, we ended up only having a very short warm up to to ride kind of from where we parked, which was by the start finish line. I mean, by the finish line and the starting line is at actually a different point. So we had a very short warm up. So I was very grateful that the, the first 12 miles of this race were at a fairly relaxed pace, even though we're, we're moving, you know, decently fast. It, it didn't feel nearly as hard as, as I anticipated. Yeah, so it's kind of funny because, uh, you know, this is a road race and, you know, a lot of people uh, 
think there's such huge differences between road races and crit races, but honestly, anytime you have a mass start and it's a, uh, you know, this type of mass race, mass start race, um, they, they, play a, they play very similar. So what I mean by that is like, when you're in the group, it's just basically drafting. When you're in a big peloton, it's just basically drafting. You can carry high speed just like you would in the crit. I know everyone gets a little panicked out about cornering in, in a pack, but um, you know, it's, it's really no difference. Most people have crashed a bike before and usually they crash in group rides, non-racing group rides on a straight road, not even in a turn on a group ride. So it's really just a little bit of a deception. Anytime we're on a two wheeled vehicle, things happen. And I just think people probably need to enjoy crits a little bit more than they do. They seem, in my opinion, scarier than they are, even though crashing is a part of it. But there was a number of crashes in this road race as well, including in this, uh, in this field, if I'm not mistaken. But for sure, in the, um, in the women's three, in the junior men, in the pro men, there's a number of crashes just in the road race, and it's a fairly straight and, and majority flat course. And as I'm sitting in here, I'm thinking I'm a little bit further back than it would really be ideal. I should, I, I would like to be maybe about 10th wheel, and I think I'm closer to 20th or something like that. Um, there is a number of riders behind me, but I'm also not wanting to do too much work to just move up unnecessarily. So I'm just trying to stay kind of protected in the pack. Oh, and we didn't mention there are some cat five riders out, out here also. So I think those are the 900 numbers. And that in front of me is Brooke. So we met last year and r rode together. And so I knew that was a familiar wheel for me at least. So I was kind of sticking to her wheel because it was one other person I'd at least ridden with before. Yeah, and I think you're not in a bad spot here. It really just depends. You're not doing too many watts. Um, you're protected from the wind here, getting a little bit of free speed. So I don't think you're in too bad of a position here. The only problem is, obviously, if there's a breakaway or something that goes off the front, you wouldn't be able to react to it. So, but other than that, you know, depending on how the, you know, the, tactically how the race is going to be, I think you're just sitting in a good spot, just kind of conserving some energy. Serving energy is important. Yeah, and it's a long race. I mean, for the most part, everyone kind of approaches it very similar. Um, you know, it's not much going on on the flats just because it's really fast. The draft matters the most on the flat court, on the flat side, and most people, you know, save their attack for the climb. You know, um, of course, you can always attack anywhere depending on the speed. But I know a lot of the fields they were you know, wait until the climb to really put in a very strong attack there. And I think the hill only has about 470 feet of climbing, which I think, I think the whole lap has about that, but there's really only one climb and it's not super steep, but it really feels like death. I mean, it's just a tear. Yeah. It's like so fast. It's, it's just, a. Uh, I've learned in, in, most races, I am not a climber against my competition, so it is a challenge. Yeah, and I think um, people underestimate it when they see that, that they see there's only 400 feet of climbing per lap, but that doesn't make it easier usually. You know, a lot of people think it's easy because it's not really steep, but anything at race pace is pretty hard. And when you have a, a you know, a um, minimal incline, you, you have to really do very high watts. So a steeper climb and a longer climb would actually, you'd have to do less watts just because you can't maintain it as much. So in a one mile climb, that's only gonna be, you know, a few minutes long, people can do four or 500 watts sometimes, depending on what field you're in um, for that duration. And that really taxes you. So, you know, just because the climb is shorter and not so steep, 
you can go a lot harder on it and that's still a, a very hard VO2 type anaerobic effort. And it looks like the pace picked up just a little bit. My heart rate went from the 120s to up to 140, which is still very low for a race. So it really felt pretty chill for the first, I'd say maybe 12 miles. I was shocked to still kind of be cruising when I looked down at about the 12 mile mark, which I'm not exactly sure where we're at now. It doesn't have the mileage on it. Yeah, you have enough uh, metrics on the screen. I don't, you know, I don't try to throw in like the laps and the mileage, but who knows, maybe in the future, I'll throw in different type of metrics. I kind of keep the same format every video. I'm a little bit of a creature of habit like that. But yeah, um, I, like you said, if it's like 16 miles per lap, I don't know, you've done two corners of the triangle. <laughs> so, so I don't know, you might, I, I can't even see where the start is now. Just, you know, I'm a little disoriented looking at that triangle <laughs> up there. But yeah, I think you're probably about two thirds through the lap, maybe. Yeah, you can see the rider here to your left is just freewheeling. She's been freewheeling for about the last five seconds. So definitely protected and getting a little bit of free ride, not spending too much energy. And that's definitely what you want. You want to pretty much save all your energy for covering moves and for that attack, I mean, for the, uh, you know, the uphill, unless you plan on putting some pressure on the field as well and attacking yourself. That was definitely not what I was planning to do. I was planning to sit in as, as long as possible. So yeah, here comes a right-hand turn here. And uh, once you make the right-hand turn, adds a little obstacle to the course as there's a pretty, uh, pretty like defined rumble strip to the right here that kind of, you know, jars your, your bike and handlebars and stuff enough. Now you guys do a good job because I believe you stay on the left side of the white line. Um, you know, when I did this race and when you're in bigger fields, People will be on both sides of the white line to the right there. And as you can see, just off the right side of the white line, that's where the rumble strip is. And it's pretty violent for a bicycle. And I believe the wind was coming from the right side. So I don't know if you could see a rider on the left just kind of moved up with very little effort. So I knew that I needed to get a little bit more protection by moving kind of to the, the, le the left a little bit more. So... I mean, I'm still here protected, but I was feeling more wind and you see I'm doing a little bit higher watt. So I think I try to find a way to, to move over a little bit at some point. And I think your cadence is actually pretty low too, um, or lower than, you know, I normally like, but I don't typically ever want to see <laughs> like your cadence lower than 85 or so, 80, if you, unless you're climbing and you know, it's on a flat course, so having that cadence in the 70s, I think is just not as efficient. Definitely makes it hard to match accelerations as well uh, when you have a cadence that's really low. Yeah, I, I think just the starting and stopping, you know, from being in the draft makes it go kind of up and down a little bit because I was just up to 100 a second ago with a little acceleration. So I think just working on what's the most efficient cadence in the draft to be able to, you know, be ready to accelerate but also not be using unneeded effort. Yeah. I mean, I understand. I, I still think it's a little low, though, because, again, if you a second ago, you're doing like 200 watts at 70 something cadence. And being that I know your FTP and stuff like that, I think it's a little too bogged down. I'm sure you're right. And it's interesting because I wouldn't have thought I was doing 200 watts at any time 
in this section, so, but it's just perceived effort when you're out there is, is definitely different than what the reality is. So just those little short, short, you know, accelerations or higher well, watts. Yeah, and like you said, if you're on the wrong side, if you're on the side that's getting wind, obviously your watts are gonna be a little bit higher as well. So as you can see, like, it seems like people are uh, pedaling a little bit easier on the left side, mm -hmm. a little less tension in the legs. So yeah, I think definitely it'd be a little better if you're in the left lane instead of the right side here. Some of those things seem like they don't make a difference, but they do. They make a big difference just on how you get taxed, how your energy level is. Um, maybe not right now, but you know, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour from now, you basically have a two hour race. So, you know, all the energy you save just, you know, kind of benefits you at the end of the race. And I was feeling that here. I'm trying to be at least staggered to the left side but it would definitely be more optimal to be in the left, you know, lane of the, the two lanes of bikes that we have here. I was happy that we were on the left side of the little rumble strip because that is not a fun, fun place to be. Yeah, so you make the switch here and move over to the left side. Looks like the, I don't know if the, the pace doesn't look like it's picked up, but your effort level did for a second, so. Yeah, I don't know if I was just trying to kind of get over and be in a better position or what I was doing. Because I'm kind of here in between. I don't have exactly a specific wheel I'm on. Yeah, I think this is fine though. I mean, you guys aren't too congested. You're not cross-wheeling anyone. You're just kind of riding offset to the middle of these two riders. But, you know, your wheel, your front wheel is protected, so you're not you know, like I said, you're not cross-wheeling anyone, so it's fine. And you might not see, like, yeah, you may have had a rider to your left and just didn't know it because we can't see him on camera. Well, and, and that may have been why I was in the middle, just with the the riders on both so sides of me. Um, but it, it is interesting. I, I think that maybe the women's fields in general, but this race had quite a bit of movement I think you know when when someone got over there was a few times where people made some more extreme movements I think even though there's like a, a lot of room yeah that happens a lot in all the lower categories it's you know people overreact to you know uh, a reaction so uh, just people are not as comfortable as riding close to people uh, as they should be and often you know, I don't know for sure, and I don't, I'm not um, trying to make a stereotype or a blanket statement, but I know that um, people said a lot of the riders were triathletes in here, and there's nothing wrong with being a triathlete. It's just the difference is uh, racing by yourself without people next to you. You just don't have that comfort level sometime. And in all those lower categories, Cat 5, Cat 4, Cat 3 even, sometimes people are just not comfortable riding, you know, shoulder to shoulder with with other riders and they don't get to practice it that often. So depending on what area you live in and how many like really competitive group rides you have, things like that, um, it's just something that people don't get to practice too often until they're in a race. So I don't know, you move back over to the right side here and not exactly sure why. Um, you know, if the wind's coming from the right side, you definitely want to be on the left. And it seemed like you did like uh, lower your watts a little bit when you were on the left, but then you move back to the right for a second. And yeah, there's definitely a lot of movement up in front. <laughs> not sure exactly why I did either, especially when I made the purposeful effort to move to the left, but here, you know, just trying to stay in the draft and 
Yeah, if you see right in front of you, uh, the rider that just moved up on your right, she was riding on the rumble strip, and you can see how wobbly she got for a second. Um, yeah, there was a lot of movement, and I think some, some braking going on. For what reason, I wasn't sure, but felt a little, um, I don't know if awkward's the right word, or just <laughs> Yeah, well, you wouldn't strange. think there would be a reason to brake here. Yeah. It's just a straightaway. So definitely there's no reason to use your brakes. And the only time somebody would be using their brakes if they, you know, uh, was gonna hit the back of someone. So, okay, no one should be on the brakes here. <laughs> and you can see, I think a couple riders up in front of you to the right, it's like girls straddling like the white line there and, um, yeah, I don't know. It seems like you guys have more room to the left that you could move over. Obviously, it's a race, so people aren't going to just always move over for you. But definitely, you don't want people being forced in that rumble swift strip that may cause a crash or something. There is a few riders moving up on the left-hand side. And when we turn the next corner is going to be the hill and I think we're getting ready for that, and that's gonna be pretty challenging. And here we kind of bunch up, which I'm doing some pretty heavy watts, so I'm not sure why we're kind of all spread out on the road, but I'm really evaluating, like, do I wanna be up further or but I was just really staying patient and not trying to do any unneeded efforts. Yeah, and it's kind of deceptive too. You know, you make that last right-hand turn and you can see the mountain in front of you. Like when you make that right-hand turn, you kind of think the climb is closer than it is, but it's really gradual. So it goes up to like one, two, three percent for a very long time. And then as you get closer to like the feed zone and stuff, I think it tops out at about 6%. So in your mind, sometimes when you make the right, you think the climb is there already. Um, but really, it's not that. It's kind of like a false flat for a while, and then it builds up into the climb. So, yeah, I don't think you want to be too far up front yet, but I definitely think you need to be probably in the top 10 spots or so by the time you hit the steeper part of the climb. I think it would have benefited me from trying to sag climb a little bit and, and just, yeah, be up front a little bit closer, try to get a jump start on the hill and maybe let people pass me <laughs> if I could because it's hard to move up spots trying to go up that, that little hill. Yeah, but like I was saying, this is a very long gradual hill, so it's a lot harder to sag climb it. You'd have to, like, basically break away to sag climb this type of long gradual hill. It's different when it's a little steeper and you're at the front of the peloton and if it's like not so easy to pass and then you can do a normal sag climb. But on a hill like this, with it being such high speed, it's a little harder to sag climb if you're not like separated from the pack. You'd have to be out in front of the peloton in order to effectively sag climb this long gradual hill because it's pretty, it's relatively flat. So staying protected in the draft is much wiser. Yeah, I would think so at this point. But I do think you, it would benefit you for being a little bit further up. Like I said, maybe like the top 10 spots. Yeah, so just for the sake of the length of the video, we're just gonna show the first like full lap here. And then we'll cut to a couple spots, cut ahead to a couple spots. But we're going to definitely show one full lap just so you get the total layout or feel for the course. And then after that, we'll uh, forward to a little bit of different action in the, you know, in the race. And here we're getting passed by some hand cycles. So I think, you know, a lot of people were, were cheering for them as they went by that I think is a, a sign also where 
maybe not putting in that much effort to get passed by the hand cycles. Well, the hand cycles are fast. I mean, there's no shame in getting passed by them. You know, they're definitely fast, and those guys are very fit as well. Guys and gals are very fit as well. So, yeah, it's no no shame getting passed by any athlete. Uh, anyone in this race, you know, is definitely a competitor. Everyone's fit. It's a big race. It's a big national race. So, yeah, definitely no shame in that. And those guys put in uh, a lot of hard work. They're low to the ground also for the aerodynamics. Um, but they don't climb that well typically. So there's a good chance you'll probably pass them back here on the uphill. We do. And here is the, the beginning of this hill. And you can see the effort is being kicked into gear. Yeah, I, I, I consider this part more of just the false flat. And I think this is why it's so deceptive because everyone knows the hill is coming. So they kind of start getting a little antsy, start thinking about this as a hill, but it's really not. And it just prolongs the effort, you know, prolongs the effort. You can see everyone's speeds going up. Uh, the body language has changed, but it's really still relatively flat here. It's just a false flat for a while. And you're gonna have like, uh, I don't know, probably less than a mile of like actual climbing. And I think here, over 21 miles per hour, definitely aerodynamics and the draft is definitely more important here. This is when the race stopped being chill and started to be a real race. <laughs> Even though it was technically a race before, it felt more like a group ride, but now it's starting to feel like here comes the, the real racing. Hey, little friend's fist bump there, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will say it was a little awkward fist bump, though. <laughs> fist bump. <laughs> but hey, it's good to see people having fun and kind of chatting it up out there as well. So yeah, as you can see, you know, you've made the right hand turn for a while now, but it's still only 1%. And it's still pretty fast you know you're pretty close to 20 miles per hour here so yeah definitely wouldn't consider it like the climb yet even though it is starting to ramp up a little bit and i think here you have a much better cadence you know it's a little high for you but it's definitely better than in the 70s you're not bogged down at all you can see your heart rate is still fairly low to compare you know, to what it would be on a heavier effort. In the video it's still looking looking pretty good. But in my memory it was a whole lot of suffering right now. Hmm. But it looks like I'm still going along just fine. Yeah, I mean, I think you did a good job overall. Um, and yeah, everyone is going to suffer. Even the people at the front often are suffering, you know? It's not easy for anyone. That's, that's one of the benefits of, like, uh, if you're able to climb, everyone's hurting a little bit. Yeah, I think within the next like maybe quarter of a mile or so, it should ramp up a little bit more and get a little steeper. Definitely putting in a lot more watts now. It's always tough to know, you know, when you're drafting someone and it's starting to spread out. Like, do I need to really make the effort and push around? Is someone letting a little gap open up? Or is it okay to just kind of stay here? And sometimes those last, those decisions can be wrong and then you're really in a difficult situation. Yeah, I think that was a good opportunity for you here. Like you see a few riders moved up on the left. 
So I definitely, at this point, if you can use anyone's energy, I'd definitely move up as others are moving up. Sometimes you can get caught like being mesmerized a little bit, staying behind a rider too long. So it's kind of like just reading the flow of traffic. If you see people moving up on one side, you kind of want to take advantage of that as well. And here you see I'm doing an over 300 watt effort. It's starting to get kind of tough. And I really tried to evaluate myself. You know, is this really like what I can do? Is it, you know, that I could have gave a harder effort or where could I have made some different choices potentially? Well, well I think one here is like we were just talking, you kind of stayed behind a little bit too long. So it may not seem like a big deal, but going around those riders, pushing your own wind to even just close that little gap, that takes a lot of energy there. When you're doing like this high of watts, like our, our little uh, sugar stores basically, because that's the type of energy you're burning when you're up into your you know, VO2 and stuff like that. I know you're not there yet because you're under 200 watts, but like now getting into 260, 270, yeah, all that glycogen is like, those stores are getting depleted fast when you're doing these type of efforts. So even just going around a couple riders and closing a gap, that takes a lot of energy to finish this climb here that you could have used to stay onto a wheel. So yeah, now the next like half a mile is, you know, the majority of the steeper part of the climb. And I think for sure here, yeah, this is where you need to be as far up to the front as possible, just to kind of stay attached with the group. So much easier said than done sometimes. Yeah. And uh, I'm starting to feel like I'm, I'm blowing up here, even though, I mean, 163 is a pretty high heart rate for me. That's probably threshold. Um, but in my, my memory banks, I'm, I'm struggling significantly here in just trying to do everything I can to hang on. Yeah, and your memory is correct because heart rate is always delayed. You know, I'm not a big believer in training by heart rate. Yes, I use heart rate as much as, uh, I mean, as well as power and cadence, all three combined. And that kind of gives you a more accurate picture of what's going on. But heart rate's delayed. Heart rate's not always accurate either. Um, and just in general, all of our hearts do not work properly. We don't, uh, we don't, we're not always in good rhythm. And sometimes you won't even notice those things unless you get followed, followed by a cardiologist or unless you really monitor your heart correctly. Oh, I mean, I'm sorry, consistently. But yeah, I think you're doing okay here. But yeah, like you said, you're probably in the hurt locker and you just needed to be further up the field. So as you fade, you'd still be attached. But if you start back in the field like this, when the separation comes and you're kind of on your own. And I was evaluating, like, did I punk out here? Should I have given a, you know, four or 500 watt effort? And there you see somebody, I'm not sure what happened, if they had an issue or if they looks, pulled off or what, but. Yeah, it looks like they unclipped and just pulled over to the side. They said, <laughs> so, enough with this climbing, I'm yeah. done. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> um, and, and here is where I saw, you know, my main competition was just a couple riders in front of me and I'm gonna just kind of miss the, the main field here. And yeah, there's, it's, it's very difficult to catch up once a gap has separated. And, and I think I really gave, other than being a little bit out of position, I think really I did kind of what I could do because I, I can't stay, you know, well above my threshold for an extended period of time. So here it was just like, okay, hey, what can you do to try to work together with some people, catch back up? The, the downhill is an opportunity where you can possibly make up some time. So this rider is really putting in a hard effort here. I think Maple and Cheese is this team with the nice pink uniforms. Yep. I think that is Camilla Hill, rider 683. 
and yes, maple and cheese. But yeah, she's definitely putting in a, a hard effort there, and you can see she's trying to stay attached. She says, "Jump on her hip here, jump on, you know, follow her wheel." <laughs> and she's really, she's like, "Come on, I need some help," <laughs> which is great. I mean, it's a great effort. Um, I think it's a great effort by all of you. I mean, I've done this race as well. The hill is just hard. Um, there's Ashley coming by. Ashley's actually really good at climbing. She just has has been off her bike for a while, so. She, She's a, a trooper just for even jumping in this race, but she's definitely not in, in shape. And she's like a really good climber. So um, normally she'd enjoy this part of the climb a little bit more, but just hasn't been on her bike enough to be really fit. But it's good that they came by, give you some relief. You get a wheel to jump on. And I'm not saying true relief, but what it does is just, um, it allows you to pace the riders in front of you and kind of, keep the pace a little bit. And being that you guys are 17, 18 miles per hour, the draft still has a really good effect here as well. And you're just about entering the feed zone. Hopefully you'll see our big bright tent to the left. Looks like we're selling ice cream with those colors, but <laughs> but I love it and it's really, uh, visually it really stands out. So that's our tent right there to the left. And you guys are doing a good job of kind of just working together here. I was so happy to see Ashley come by because I hadn't seen her in the whole race and you really shouldn't be looking back for safety reasons so I wasn't sure if she was kind of right behind me or if anything had happened but I was very happy to see her come by and a few riders so I was hopeful to kind of think of working together and, and trying to catch the group because it's a long race so I know that people fade and so I'm thinking of how to get kind of things organized and get us going in the pace line. Yeah. And then coming up is going to be the finish line. So this is the finish line right here. Yeah. And so the same thing happened here, which you probably didn't realize it, but Ashley lost touch to the group that was in front too. And the both you and the young lady in front of Ashley that went around her a second ago, you both stayed behind her a little bit too long. And see, now you're passing her as well. So again, when you are behind someone that's getting dropped, you got to make the, the move to get around them and stay attached to the wheels in front. It's a good job here. It looks like you're catching up a little bit. You're not quite to the downhill yet, but um, just about. The problem is with this downhill, um, yeah, it seems like it gives you a good chance to recover. But honestly, when the riders in front of you hit the downhill first, and that's just, that puts such a, a gap in between you if you're not over the hump and they're on the downhill. The speed, in, the speed difference is so high, it just uh, opens that gap up really well. Painful. Help is on the way. I found out, I'm not sure what team that is in the blue, but they had a handful of riders, and I found out that they're a relatively new team. I talked to one of their riders. Yeah, I believe that's Regroup. I believe they just kind of organized or started maybe in January, so. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know who's who uh, until I see their number. But I, I know uh, we picked up a follower. I think Megan Newton started following us uh, after Valley of the Sun. That might have been who you talked to. But um, yeah, the, the group is regroup, and yes, they're in the race with you here. I believe they had uh, you know, a decent amount of numbers in this race, maybe four or five riders. So yeah, uh, you're coming up to just about one full lap. I can't remember if you've passed the start line already, um, but yeah, the start and finish line are, I don't know, they might be a couple miles away from each other. <laughs> I, I actually tried to walk it and wasn't too successful. I had uh, for the Cat 3 race, we had two women in the Cat 3 race and I left an hour before their race walking with two sets of tires to get into the truck, you know, um, just so they can have wheels in the truck in case they flat it. 
and I walked for an hour and did not make it. So, yeah, it's a little bit more than two miles, I believe, from the start line, I mean, from the finish line to the start line. And yeah, that was a painful walk. I was, yeah. And I never got the spare tires there, so luckily no one flatted. Yeah, I think it had to be more than two miles because I estimated two miles based on each lap being 16 miles times three, that's 48. The race was 46. So I thought, okay, that's a two mile difference, but it was not. It was much more than two, two miles. So here I see a whole bunch of group working together um, and then we're coming in shortly to the right hand turn and it is a little bit of a you know maybe intimidating corner just with the cattle guard being at the end of it and I think maybe just well slightly decreasing radius or at least yeah I think it's more than slightly if you look at the map there definitely decreasing radius <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, it, it is intimidating because it's really fast downhill. Um, you can go into it over 30 miles per hour. It's decreasing radius and where it tightens up at or where you kind of have your exit point at, that's where the cattle guard is and a guardrail on the outside. So yeah, definitely can be intimidating. And I'm not sure if we had kind of started organizing yet or if we're all just kind of free-flowing? No, you're still free-flowing. You're not going to organize until after the turn. Okay. If my memory serves me correctly. My memory obviously does not serve me correctly. But there, this is a group of eight or nine of, of us women together, so nice to have a group to work with for sure yeah and i shouldn't say you're not organized i do yes you were speaking at this time trying to tell i basically you kind of you know were the ringleader of organizing trying to get a dynamic baseline organized um you know i think you guys did a great job the women some of the women you can tell they've never done a dynamic baseline or maybe even any baseline i really don't know but i can tell by the way they r wrote it even after you were trying to get them to organize is that they weren't real comfortable or familiar with the concepts of how the pace line works. As you can see now, like you're trying to pass uh, one of the riders and the rider's almost competing with you to make it to get past. But basically when you rotate to the right, you should be shutting it down for the most part and easing back. You don't, um, you're not gonna keep your effort going while you rotate to the right. So after you rotate to the right here, um, like you see Ellen, her watch should start coming down and she should start fading back. Um, and then it, it's, it's kind of like your, almost your hardest effort should be getting back into the rotation, not the pull through. The pull through is you want to maintain like just your uh, normal speed or the group of the speed on the left is just maintaining. You're not trying to pull hard each time you come through. It needs to be really smooth. And then the right side is where you're going to rest and recover as you fall back. So it's kind of like five second effort. And then you're going to get about 40 seconds to a minute of rest, depending on how many people are here. So you guys got like eight riders. So it really should be a five second effort to pull through and rotate to the right and then 40 seconds of rest. But you'll see like uh, some of the riders on the right are still riding hard after they pull through instead of taking their recovery. But like I said, if they haven't done it often or don't get a chance to practice it with their team, then yeah, you're not gonna obviously understand that concept. Mm -hmm. And here is the corner. I think we're about to hit the corner. Yeah, just about. And here's the example, like you're doing 230 and it's hard for you to pass the rider that should be going backwards. That, so obviously that rider is putting in a 230 or 200 plus effort and you got two people just wasting energy here on the, in the group. Yeah, it was kind of a lot of work to organize. I mean, I was doing a lot of commands and it's always a struggle, like how much direction do you give? And then of course, nobody has to listen to anybody else. So nobody has to listen to me. Um, and so it's like, is it been well received? Is it direction that is wanted because people don't know or are people just doing their own thing because they're in a race and want to do that? It, but the, the feedback I got from a number of writers is they really appreciated it. 
and they had never done it before is what I heard back from at least some people. So yeah, and even feedback in the race. So was here's your positive. here's your turn, and it is good. You go to the left side, high speed. Um, you're gonna take a late apex here, right there, hitting the apex sets you up good for an exit, and then across the cattle guard. Um, but yeah, I mean, so here's the thing with the pace lining. Um, well, I was just going to say, so here yeah, you can, I can see the, the riders in front of me, uh, the group in front of me, and I'm, I made significant speed up on them. And I look back and there's nobody there. I can't even see anybody. So on that corner that I took, I just, I didn't know if something had happened to the riders because I really couldn't see anybody. So I thought, let me try to bridge to this group. But I felt the wind by myself. I see that I'm doing an above threshold effort. And even though the group is like, I mean, it looks really small in the video, but in my yeah, my they're only eye, like a hundred like, yards in front of you or something like, like I that. can close that gap and then be with the next group. But then I realize by how slowly I'm catching them that I'm going to have to do a massive effort, and and I may not be able to do it. So then I decide to kind of shut it down, and you know, the group of eight of us, if we can really work together, that gives us, a, I think, a really good chance of catching that group in front of us. So here's where the group comes back by. I fast forwarded it a little bit, um, but here's where the group comes back by. And then you guys, because you started the rotation already, um, because you started the rotation already, you guys pick it back up this time a lot easier. Um, but back to what you were saying, like, yeah, every, you know, when you're in a race, it is tricky. I've done this before as well, where we formed a chase group at a Tour de Marietta uh, maybe last year, I think it was, or a year before, I can't remember. But anyway, um, yeah, the, sometimes people will not cooperate. And of course, that's their prerogative. They don't have to because it is a race. But I think what people don't understand when they're racing is once you get dropped, you have to form some type of group of frenemies, basically. Um, and basically, a frenemy is someone that you're friends with temporarily um, before one of you guys or all of you have to stab each other in the back because at the very end of the race, obviously you're racing, but you form a little group of friends for mutual benefit, because if you guys stay at a constant, steady, fast pace here while taking um, a chance to recover when it's not your pool, you definitely can catch the group in front of you because the group in front of you is a big blob. They're not working together and their speed's gonna fluctuate. It's gonna speed up, it's gonna slow down. And if you keep that constant speed, you definitely have a better chance of catching them than trying to attack your group on your own because you're not going to make it 16 miles or five or eight miles that it will take to catch them um, in like a VO2 type effort. So it's a lot better to um, work as a team, carry that consistent 22, 23, 24 mile per hour speed. And obviously you have to hope that the group plays games a little bit in front of you that gives you a chance because if not, you wouldn't be dropped. If you're just as fast and going as fast as everybody in the group in front of you on your own, you would have been able to stay with the group. So your best chance now is the teamwork aspect of this race. So there's nine of us here. And so I'm, I'm just telling the women that like, hey, we work together, we go faster as a group, pull through steady. You know, some people I'm telling them you can ease off when after you take your turn. Some people were thanking me in the race. Some people didn't say anything. So it's it's just hard to know like how much direction to give. But I was pretty proud of myself for feeling like I I really organized a group of eight or nine women and us to get a dynamic baseline going pretty good. Um, and we were catching the group in front of us and it looked like we were gonna pass them pretty quickly. I mean, I was even so confident of, of us catching them. I, I said, hey, let's just blow by them when we catch them and, and make them do the work to catch back on because I, I exactly what Anthony was saying. I knew that there's a reason we got dropped. They were obviously faster than us, but if we are working together in this many women, the draft is pretty significant. It actually felt really easy. So I was feeling, very comfortable even though sometimes the watts are still kind of high and you can see them fluctuating at threshold but you see here I'm just doing 60 70 watts as I'm kind of floating backwards and it it felt like a, a really significant amount of recovery time 
Well, it should be. If you do the pace line correctly, it should be. You should be recovering here. Like I said, the only time is you do have to keep your legs moving. So when the last rider comes by you, that you don't have to put in too big of a spike to jump back on. And if you're communicating correctly and that person tells you last, last meaning that they're the last person in that rotation, then you should be able to, you know, speed up just a little bit and get on to the back of them. As you can see here, you should still be getting a fairly good draft as you are. Um, so yeah, it really should be kind of like a five second effort and you should get like 40 seconds to a minute of rest, depending on if you guys have eight or whatever people, eight to 10 people, you should be getting close to a minute of rest. And some people were saying last, some people were saying clear when it was clear to go over. And, you know, I noticed some of the riders were looking back kind of significantly to before getting over, which. Just know, their really, comfort level. Yeah. Right. Which I wasn't going to tell anybody anything about that because I didn't want to be potentially the reason that someone crashes or crashes. whatever. Yeah. So I, I, I was, you know, second guessing kind of like how much to say because people have to ride within what they're comfortable with. Ashley did say at one point, like, I don't know how much I'm longer I'm going to be able to hang on. I told her, just give your turn a time or two. Um, but she said, you know, it was pretty hard to even stay in the draft. Yeah, but that's mainly just because she hasn't been riding. Um, obviously, we've ridden the last year or so with her. So, um, yeah, and Ashley just started racing last year. So, but yeah, um, you can tell, like, it's a good job of rotating and I think it's a good experience for all the girls involved. Um, you know, I would hope at least if they haven't done it before, it's probably a good experience and they definitely will be able to carry these types of experiences into other races, especially like the regroup team. I think there's three or four girls just in this group alone. So definitely they would have a chance to practice it again or to perform it again in another race if they're ever in the same situation. Um, but yeah, in general, Technically, you guys should be actually a lot closer than you are to each other. Um, not just rotating through, but when you pass, you should be really close. That The tighter the group can be, the more aerodynamic benefit you'll have, the more recovery you'll have. But obviously, you're spaced out the way you are because of people's comfort levels, and that's great, that's fine. Um, you definitely wanna be safe first, especially if you uh, have never done it before. And it's not like someone's there giving you true instruction. I think we, we did get a little bit tighter as the as the rotations went on. So yeah. I think people's comfort level increased a little bit. Yeah. But here you see there's... Well, there's a of, significant gap. Like, I mean, really, you guys should be almost shoulder to shoulder passing each other here. I mean, you know, it could be 10 inches in between you guys, but you guys have a, another entire rider can fit in between you right now. But like I said, that's better safe than sorry. If it's not your... You know, you're not used to this. You've never written with any of the girls before other than Ashley. Um, I'm assuming a lot of the girls haven't written with each other either, and they've never done the drill before. So yeah, I mean, I think it worked out under the circumstances. I think you guys did a really good job. I think this is a master's 50 plus writer in front of me. I wanna say her name is Mandy. Um, but it, it was kind of funny because I was telling the riders like, hey, you know, if anyone's struggling, just, you know, let somebody know, skip your pull. Because if if somebody just tells tells the next person, hey, go or whatever, um, then a huge gap doesn't open up if somebody's getting dropped off the back. Um, and I think she said, um, does it look like I'm struggling? <laughs> I said, no. Yeah. So here I fast forwarded to another spot. Um, you guys basically just continue to pace line. But what I was gonna say here, you're coming up to a turn and you're already doing the dynamic pace line, but the rider in black should fade back, but she's riding a little bit too hard. So the, the regroup woman wasn't able to pass her. But basically when you're going into a turn, you know, whoever's turn it is, you kind of put your hand up and point the direction of the turn, which the regroup rider did. But you really should go through the turn single file there and then go back into the rotation again. You just could have, uh, you don't wanna have any miscommunications depending on what line someone's taking or what apex they try to hit. 
So really you should go through the turn single file and then start your rotation all over again. So I fast forwarded again here. This is Ellen just, again, uh, you guys are still on the pace line, but I just wanted to show like the speed in which Ellen takes this turn again. A lot of the group um, we noticed like slowed down a lot for that turn one. And I just think Ellen did a really good job of carrying speed and holding her speed through this turn. And each time she opened like a big gap just by carrying speed, uh, unintentionally opening a big gap just by carrying speed while some of the other riders slowed down a lot for this turn. And after the first corner, I, and, and seeing the gap that was opened up, I actually was kind of saying, hey, just stay wide, we can carry speed in through the corner. And so I was hoping that the group would just follow my, my line. Yeah, but again, it's just kind of the same with the pace lines. It's like, I think the thing that's missing from racing, it's not skills, courses and stuff like that, even though those are extremely um, valuable. But I think the main thing people lack is concepts concepts of racing concepts of uh right line choices all those kind of things i think is what needs to be taught more because really that's a turn that everybody should be carrying high speed through so yeah i think we're going to fast forward to the end of the race now um just for time's sake and for the most part um it's just basically pace lining again throughout the entire rest of the race until the climb separates everyone Keep going, so yeah, here's Ellen. Ellen's finish here. Yeah. Let's go, Ellen. You can get her. Let's go. Let's go. You're almost done. Almost done. Almost done. Go, 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 go. Woo. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you tomorrow for day three and the conclusion of Valley of the Sun stage race.